Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening in person at the Hindu. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. John Dino from G. Hitachi Nuclear Energy. Uh, Dr. Dino is the manager of the Generation 4 at Advanced Reactor Nuclear Systems Engineering at the G. Hitachi Nuclear Energy. So, in his role, he's responsible for system engineering technical leadership for all GH. Uh, high temperature generation for and advanced reactor technologies, including Mayfield, Prism, uh, micro reactors, space reactors, and the VTR program. So John has worked for GE uh, since 1999 for several different roles. And before joining GE, John worked for National Health for 10 years. And before that, he started his career in 1986 as a shield, uh, shield design engineer for General Dynamics. So John received his bachelor's degree from our department uh, and a master's and PhD degree in, from Georgia Tech. So he currently holds a part-time teaching position at UNC Wilmington, and he's also an associate teaching professor in our department. Um, so his talk today is about the GH advanced and nuclear reactor projects. Uh, so at the end of the presentation, we have about the ten minutes for the Q and A. So for the remote audience, uh, you can either raise your hand and or type your questions in the chat. For the in-person audience, just to raise your hand, I will moderate the Q&A, okay? So John, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Is there a best place to stand if this is being recorded? I don't want to block the screen on that. I'm not that tall, I guess, so I'm probably safe in doing that. Okay, uh, well, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak. It really is a great pleasure to be here uh, to see everybody today. Um, and we have about an hour or so to go through. So I'm... I tend to be a little more open in my communication style. I, we can take questions as we go. We don't have to wait until the end because I know what that's like. You wait till the end and then you forget your question, right? And then you walk out and you go back to your room and then you realize the question you forgot to ask. So we'll try to take it as we go. And I'll move through this pretty quickly. Um, so uh, as Dr. Wu said, uh, GE Hitachi, we've got a number of really interesting advanced reactor projects going on um, that have started up just in the last 18 months uh, that I'll try to share with you. Um, a little bit about uh, some of the activities we have going on. Uh, some of them are partnerships, some of them are work that we're doing ourselves. And so uh, I hope you'll find it interesting and uh, we'll see what's the best way to do this. Is it the down button? Let's see. I don't know. Did you do the right button and the battery maybe? Oh, okay. Yeah, right button seems to. Oh, let me see. Does it have to be in full screen mode? Yeah, I don't think it's presentation mode. Maybe. Okay, let's see. All right, let's go to presentation mode here. Uh, no, that's not really what is this. Uh, where is it? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, control F. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Mario. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll go with one. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> nice. That's good. <laughs> so tell a joke, John. I'm gonna have to tell a joke. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see. I actually do have a good joke. You probably heard this before. So um, guy goes into. Uh, hold on. Let me get it right here. So. Uh, Neutron goes into a bar. Who's heard this? Neutron goes into a bar. He gets a drink, right? Bartender says, uh, uh, here's your drink. Uh, Neutron says, okay, great. How, what, how, what are we okay. The Bartender says, no charge. No charge. No charge. <laughs> there, you go. Exactly. there are not a lot of good nuclear engineering jokes. I think. Maybe that's one of them. I used to have a really good joke about Schrodinger's cat, but I have long since forgotten that. So I can't remember these things. But, uh, Okay, well, while we're waiting, I mean, just, I mean, I'll, I'll just kind of field questions from the group, just in terms of anything about my work history or experiences you heard that were mentioned. I have worked for GE 20, I'm coming up on 23 years now. Yes. Yeah, maybe yeah, I'll skip time for this question. So, yeah. um, how do you actually manage the manager and the tech and professor? Yeah, good question. My wife asks me that a <laughs> lot. Um, so, I don't teach all the time. So I just, I'm right now I'm just teaching uh, one class and then Dr. Wu and I have other class this fall. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's really not that difficult. I mean, it's the you know, time management is always a key in life, right? You gotta make, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, but I will say, as you can probably tell, oh, you may not remember the slide, but it's, my title is engineering manager. 
right? So that's code word for I don't do any real work anymore, right? So I spend most of my days, it's like, I think somebody maybe asked me, how do I spend my days or what do I do? Oh, shoot, yeah. How do I spend my days? And basically I spend my days just talking to people because we are in a very active hiring mode right now. So I'm interviewing a lot of people, talking to a lot of managers, talking to a lot of other teams as we're trying to coordinate um, a number of the different projects we have. Hey, there you go. Thank you, sir. So control F, yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's see how we're doing. All right, there you go. So we're going to try to move through this pretty quickly. Uh, we will take questions as we go, um, but please stop me, raise your hand, give me the high sign. So a little bit about GE's history, GEH's history. Not going to spend a lot of time on that. Really want to focus more on the current status of a couple of big projects we've got going on right now. The X three hundred, obviously, uh, big announcement back in December about. Uh, uh, being awarded the contract for Ontario Power. And just a few weeks ago, TVA announced that they want to partner with us on an X300 in Tennessee. So very exciting. Lots of things happening for X300 right now. Uh, the Natrium and other sodium fast projects. Um, we've been under work on underway on Natrium for a little over a year, here in a few months, which is part of the ARDP, Advanced Reactor Demonstration project. And then we got some kind of interesting micro reactor projects going on that we'll spend a little bit of time talking about. Uh, that you might find interesting. So GE has a pretty extensive history um, in the nuclear industry. Um, actually, Johnny, I did not realize that GE was was the one that designed and built NPD in Canada. I, didn't know that I did not know that either as I was studying the history. But when you had it in your thesis, I was like, wow, NPD. So nuclear power demonstration, is that what it is? So we got a lot of history in the industry. Um, what's not shown on here are things like nuclear submarines, um, work, you know, work that's been done throughout the, you know, the history of running, running uh, DOE sites and labs and those things. This is really just what I'll call the commercial nuclear timeline for GE Itachi and GE Nuclear. So we've been in a lot of things. Uh, that right there, let's see, is there a, is it one of these is a, uh, this one? So that right there, anybody know what that is? Close, close. So back in the 1950s, somebody thought it would be a good idea to put a nuclear reactor on an airplane and fly it around. So that is a nuclear jet engine. So air comes in, the intake goes through the reactor, gets heated, and then gets exhausted out, the back, compressed, heated, and exhausted out the back. Needless to say, that project didn't really go far, much farther than a conceptual and a prototype design that never actually flew. But yes, we were doing things like that in the 1950s. Um, and I would hesitate to say that right now, the, the sort of the level of excitement in the industry is starting to rival what was going on back here in those days, just with all the new projects and activities we have going on. Okay, so uh, had, we had this in, PP, in PowerPoint, you see this nice little uh, BWR uh, water boil cycle, direct cycle for BWR. Uh, but again, this is where GE has really sort of made its name known throughout the industry with uh, boiling water reactor technology, low enriched fuel. Won't spend a lot of time on this. You all know what a BWR is. Um, the history of BWR is kind of fascinating because we started out with really small little BWRs. Then they got really, really big, and now they're going smaller again as we go to SMRs or small modular reactors. Um, we'll focus a little bit on some of the uh, improvements and simplifications that have been made over the years. Uh, we see a very strong desire now in the industry to go toward the simplified, passively safe natural circulation systems. Um, ESBWR was our very, very large non-SMR version of that. And now we're looking at the BWR X300, a much smaller version of it, but still utilizing natural circulation at full power. So interest, some interesting aspects there. And you can kind of tell uh, from the early Gen 2, 3s all the way up to the Gen 3 plus. Um, so we've seen a pretty significant improvement in terms of uh, PRA, core damage frequency, um, and, um, and as we've gone through, as we've gone through the history. Um, so, okay, so BWR X300, again, 300 megawatt electric, Small modular reactor. Um, here are some of the key takeaway points. I won't read them all. You can you can read them. Um, we're we're definitely looking at a number of things that really are going to be important for the next generation SMRs. 
A design to cost approach is extremely important. Um, you don't have to look any further than what's going on at Vogel three and four right now to know that something is designed for a certain price, but then when it actually gets built, uh, the amount of money take, needed to make it and build it is significantly higher. So design to cost approach, building in cost as one of the significant variables for the design is important. Um, not without compromising safety, without compromising uh, integrity. Uh, constructability integrated into the design. You probably see this a lot with a lot of the SMRs, this modularization of construction, design and construction, which will hopefully, hopefully reduce costs significantly. Um, we have initiated some licensing right now, uh, activities in the US, and I mentioned Ontario Power in Canada. So it's the BWRX because it's the 10th generation boiling water reactor for GE. So we've had BWR one through six, uh, we've had SBWR, ABWR, ESBWR, and now X300. So it's our 10th generation BWR. Okay, no questions, I'll keep going. So it's essentially, although not exactly, uh, a, a significantly simplified version of the much larger ESBWR. Um, still takes advantage of isolation condenser system, uh, considerably smaller core volume, smaller power level, uh, a much taller and skinnier core. Um, and you can see some of the specific components that have been eliminated and or simplified. Uh, the use of passive containment cooling, um, uh, the use of steel bricks, steel composite, that's a really interesting one, uh, steel bricks, steel construction, where we use steel composite, a concrete steel composite, which we think will yield a significant reduction in on-site cost for, for pouring concrete and, and putting together the containment and the structure. So over 50% volume reduction from the building, and we are expecting significantly less concrete and concrete on-site construction. So really trying to modularize it and trying to get it to the point where the on-site construction can be carried out in a pretty effect, efficient way because um, that really is one of the big driving cost factors for the SMRs these days, um, is just the initial upfront investment. I don't know the exact number now, but I think we're targeting something in the, in the range of about a, 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 about a billion dollars. Don't quote me on that, but that's, that, is the, that is the expected target we're looking at to get it on the grid for a billion, which might sound like a lot of money, but actually when you consider Vogel unit three and four is closing in on 30 billion, a billion sounds like quite a bargain, doesn't it? Um, okay, so natural circulation, isolation condenser system, trying to design out failure modes is probably the biggest thing for us. Um, had this been in PowerPoint, this would have been a really cool little uh, animation here. Uh, but eliminating the need for multiple redundant systems, removing decay heat uh, while, while maintaining uh, water inventory. So the core is designed to operate in natural circulation at full rated power. So there are no pumps. There's no recirculation pumps. The system runs at full rate of power on natural circulation. So if you have a loss of power or a loss of offset power and it scrams, it just shuts down. I mean, it, it, it doesn't need pumping at full rate of power. So it doesn't need pumping at shutdown conditions. So it just cools itself passively. So this is going to be, I think, something that is going to be significant uh, for, for the industry and for, for the design that we have. Um, <clears throat> Inherent safe, inherent safety, no operator action or, or external AC power, which, as you know, got what got Fukushima in trouble uh, when they had tsunami and knocked out all offsite power, couldn't get pumping um, onto, couldn't get water on the core uh, for a few days, and that did not end well. So we're really hoping that this is going to give us an opportunity to really design out a lot of those safety concerns. Um, again, I won't go into a lot of details here. Isolation condenser loops. Um, Separate cooling water uh, pool below the refuel floor can cool for seven days without needing to add water to it. Um, independent isolation and initiation valves. And one loop can remove 100% of the decay heat immediately after shutdown. So even if something were to happen to, uh, to the other ICS systems, one loop is capable of, of just passively cooling it on just decay heat alone immediately after shutdown. So lots of redundancy, uh, lots of safety built in. And I think the idea here is that uh, uh, we'll be able to put these out in, in a way that will really allow for a good safe operation. Um, control rods, so because we don't have research flow, because there are no research pumps, there's no research system, 
the power is controlled by two variables. One is obviously control rods, control blades, which is actually very similar to the way BWRs today are control, control reactivity. And the other one is inlet feed water temperature. So rather than being able to drive research flow and adjust control rods, now you've got to adjust control rods and control your inlet feed water temperature. So it's a little bit of a different you know, operational scheme than BWRs in the past. The control rods are actually very similar to the ones that we have in our existing DWRs. There's no significant motivation to change it. We've got many, many years of operating history with our, with our current reactivity control system. We're going to leverage all of that. We're not reinventing the wheel here um, because there's no, no reason to. Um, control blade looks pretty much like any other BWR control blade. It's shorter because uh, the fuel is only about 10 feet tall in this core as opposed to about 12 feet. Uh, active lane for a typical BWR, um, but again, you know, a, a cruciform uh, construction with boron B4C tubes in, in, in between a control cluster with fuel bundles. And the hydraulic the HCUs uh, operate in the same way. So really it's basically you know, almost exactly what we have today in our current uh, reactivity control systems. Here's what I was mentioning that um, rather than a, rather than a uh, power flow map, uh, because you can control research flow. Now it's a it's a feed water a power feed water temperature curve because you're you're going to be utilizing the fact that as you uh, as you increase as the power increases that re generates a negative reactivity in the core because of the voiding. Um, but it, the opposite happens after you start getting significant significant voiding. That is a negative reactivity because you're displacing moderator. And so BWRs tend to be self modulating in that way. Um, and control rods, and then adjusting the feed water temperature of the incoming feed water is really the control scheme here. So, again, passive safety, passive control, um, minimal operator interaction. That's really the what we're going for for the for the BWR X three hundred. Uh, the core does look a little different. So, in most BWRs, you've got your fuel down here, and you've got your steam dryers and separators. But we've got this strange thing in between them called a chimney, um, which is actually a tall structure that helps to reduce that two-phase pressure drop across the core because the core is actually not as tall as a typical BWR. It helps increase the driving head, reduces to reduce flow restrictions. We have a down comber and then low, a lower pressure drop across the core. Um, but again, all passive safety, all natural circulation, um, no need to worry about pumps failing or valves uh, closing because there are none. Um, it's a passive safety system, passive cooling system. Control the fuel looks amazingly similar to every fuel bundle we pay. We're, we continue to evolve the design. We are looking at going above 5% enrichment for uh, the next generation fuel because of the uh, accident tolerant fuel programs. I'm guessing maybe you've heard of that, um, which utilize cladding that has a uh, slightly more new parasitic neutron absorption. Um, so some of our more advanced product lines as we go beyond GNF3 will actually take advantage of the what's been learned with the accident tolerant fuel testing, um, which will go above 5%. But right now we're limited to 5%. But it looks like a typical BWR fuel bundle. We've had a lot of operating history, a lot of experience. We're not making any radical changes to the, to the fuel design. And over the years, we've seen significant improvements um, in terms of fuel failures and leak detection. Uh, over the years, and uh, and this is something we definitely want to try to leverage, you know, as we go beyond, uh, as we go into the you know the next decade. Okay, so that's a real quick fifteen minutes on BWRs and BWRX. Any questions on that? Yes, I want to get some water. I'm starting to dry out already. Uh, how tall is the chimney? Um, don't know exactly, but I want to say if you look at the photograph. Oh, can I go backwards here? Yeah, you can. If it's to scale, which I believe it is, so this is 10 feet, this is 10 feet. So it's, uh, I'm guessing it's gotta be somewhere around 20 feet. And the reason I don't know that is because I don't work on BWRs. I work on the Gen 4 reactors. So, but it's pretty tall. It is pretty tall. Um, it's a large piece of, of metal, a large structure. So John, can you click on the chat? He knows a very question. Oh, we got a question. All right, let's see. I mean, how do I do that? Let's see. What is the conduction scheme for passive cooling? Is the vessel thinned or is there sufficient? Uh, no, not, not uh, conduction. 
scheme for passive cooling. Yeah, it's not air circulation, but water circulation. Am I missing the question here? Is the vessel, vessel is not thin, but it does have a down coma region um, here. It does have a down coma region here. Maybe the question is maybe during accident conditions, what is likely, is there any air convection or conduction, like ultimately it's sinking out? No, uh, yeah, no, no. But it's hard to say. Yeah, not that I know. Okay, all right. <clears throat> all right. Thank you for pointing that out. I didn't realize there were, we had questions on there. All right, so let's see. Oh, wait a minute. I gotta, I gotta go back into presentation mode, maybe. Okay, there we go. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, yes. Um, before going to the stuff. Um, yeah. So I might be wrong, but my understanding is that the understanding of the physics from the beginning of nuclear history, we knew that we could um, design small reactors, right? Mm -hmm. But we um, tried to leverage the Concept of economy of scale. Okay. So we went with the um, large size reactors. Yeah. So what's happening now? Why the transition towards you know, those small reactors? And what's yeah. guaranteed? Yeah. It's a Great question. That's not me. Great question. So it's essentially driven by cost. So the capital upfront cost for some of those large, and let me go back because that's a really good question. So let, let's go back to the little uh, picture of the, the history timeline there. So when you look at these plants as they got larger and larger, back then, back in this back in this day and age for BWR ones and twos and even threes and fours, the initial investment up front, the initial capital upfront investment was something utilities could tolerate. They were willing to take make that investment. But as time got went on and the plants got bigger and bigger and bigger, it became more and more expensive. And right now it is really driven by essentially uh, principally cost because as, as the example I gave with, with the Volvo, I mean, you know, you're, if you're looking at a $10 billion plant, like let's say one of these here, I mean, you're, you're basically betting the company on that project. I mean, that's a significant gamble you're taking with $10 billion. Oh, and you won't get your return on investment for like 10 years because we're not gonna be generating electricity for a decade or more. So, I mean, if I was Bill Gates and I had $10 billion in the cushions of my couch, I'm not so sure I'd be willing to drop 10 billion on something that might or might not ever get built. And even if it does, I gotta wait 10 years to get a return on my investment. It's really cost, it really is cost. So part of this is not just safety, but initial upfront cost to build. That's why the design to cost approach is so significant because we've gotta be able to put this on the grid for costs, levelized costs that are comparable to wind, solar, hydro, natural gas. Back in these days, we didn't worry about competing with those. We just worried about competing with other nuclear. Now we're competing with all these other energy sources and we gotta be competitive with those as well. And part of that is the initial upfront cost. So I, I would say it's really money is probably the biggest driver to reduce the initial upfront cost. So why did the paradigm change from, protect, from competing with nuclear only to competing with all these other? Um, Who was the main driver of that? It's a, that's a pretty complex question. I will tell you what's driving it now is these net zero carbon uh, climate concerns. Um, because I don't see anybody building lots of coal plants anymore. But I do see people putting up solar farms, wind farms, uh, hydro. So I think there's a social political factors certainly are there, but yeah, we've got to, if we're going to play in this game, we've got to be on a level playing field with all the other forms of energy. Otherwise, nobody's going to want to buy us. They're just going to put up a solar farm. Right? Yeah. yeah, John. I was going to say, I think um, <clears throat> there was a large scale deployment of those technologies. That too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but, but yeah. I, I think another factor with, with smaller reactor demand is as you replace coal. Yep. I mean the, the grid or rural grids, right? They they cannot support your uh, you know one gigawatt uh, reactors. Yeah, right? correct. It's actually and, if you size it similar to former coal, I mean it's yes. a perfect grid fit. Correct. And so what we would envision is as the older coal plants come offline, if you've got something that is of a comparable 
power level that can replace it, then it's a one for one that works. Or if you're, or if you've got older nuclear plants that admittedly are getting old, I mean, some of these things were built in the 60s, right, and 70s, as they come offline, then you're looking at replacing them with maybe a couple of these BWRX 300s, right? So I think it plays in a lot of ways. I think, I think there's a, a number of factors here, but yeah, you're right. There wasn't anything to compete with back then either. There was no solar and wind. So it, it's, a, it's, it's definitely a changing landscape for sure. Okay, all right, let me keep any other questions. Those were, those were good questions. All right, so sodium reactor project. So this is, this is where my team spends most of our time with the Gen 4 advanced reactor projects. Um, so we've been working on VTR for the last three years. We are currently not working on it since there was no funding from the DOE for fiscal year 22. But for the last three years, we have been working and supporting the development of VTR. We hope it comes back. We think it is absolutely positively needed, especially if we're going to be looking at Gen 4 advanced reactors in the future. I won't spend a lot of time on this just to kind of show you. This is mostly just high level uh, in terms of timeline uh, and, um, and the different uh, DOE decisions of record. Um, and so we made it to CD1 um, and we are, on, we are on pause at the moment. Uh, there is the core of a schematic of the core based on the prism prism a mod a design which is ge's legacy sodium fast reactor um and um and we we've got a lot of history in terms of design basis information that we've used over the years um we are also just as a as a point of note we are also talking to customers who may be interested in this prism technology for deployment for power generation this is this is a research and test reactor, so it's just venting heat to the environment. There's no power conversion or steam cycle on the back end of it because it's a test reactor. Um, but still, um, but we are we are still very encouraged by this and hoping that it will continue to move forward. This has been a pretty big project. We've been partnered with Bechtel National Labs. If I'm not mistaken, NC State was involved in this. I saw uh, I saw their their dot on the map. Um, I'll show that in a minute. It also had a number of uh, experimental test vehicles because obviously it's a test reactor. You want to be able to insert things, do irradiations, do materials testing, uh, nuclear instrumentation testing, um, all kinds of different flow tests, thermal tests. Um, and so it really, it, it, I, we think it's going to be a really, really significant uh, asset for the DOE and for the, uh, the nuclear industry um, as we go forward. So we're very hopeful that this will come back. Um, so these are the number, this is sort of a high level look. So here's, uh, yeah, it looks like number seven right there. There's 23, that's GE. So a number of folks are involved in this and have been involved in this for the past few years. Um, some of them through uh, INL, some through the DOE, um, but again, a blanket master contract uh, for the engineering and design construction. Uh, right now, Bechtel, if we do go to the next phase, which will be a construction contract. Bechtel will have the lead because they're our, our AE firm. And we're going to be partnering with TerraPower, uh, at GE Itachi and TerraPower for phase, for the next phase, for the construction phase. So we're hoping that will happen sometime in the future. Okay, any questions on BTR? Just some conclusions and some quick summary. Um, but like I say, we're also, uh, there's also considerable interest outside the US um, in this as well, uh, because it's been a long time since we built a sodium fast reactor. Um, and the FFTF facility in Hanford shut down about 30 years ago. Um, so we really need this type of technology going forward um, to, uh, to sort of push the, the, the technology forward for the future for sodium reactors. So we are very encouraged by this. Yeah. So, so it is something in chat, maybe? I don't know. Oh, chat. Yes, thank you. I'm glad you see these things. I don't, I don't even look up here. They're developing reactors that convert CO2 to diesel. So the singular reactor could provide. Uh, there are, but we are not involved in any of those at the moment. But that's a good question. Um, there are a number of groups that are looking at um, using nuclear generated heat for other applications, industrial type applications. Uh, but we are not at the moment. Yes, yes. Is the, the fuel metallic? Yes. Metallic fuel, um, and um, and and it will be for the next uh, project that I'm about to show you as well. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Uh, 
questions. Good. Yes. So, kind of jumping ahead, but it's on the topic of BTR. Okay. Do you think that it's essential to have a BTR reactor built so that you can test and validate your materials yeah. uh, before you say deploy the R one hundred? Yeah, I would say yes. Our friends in the DOE might not agree with that, but I would say. If you look at the way we've done things throughout our history in the industry, we've always started with small little experimental test reactors and then scaled them up once we demonstrated that they worked. Now, having said that, it's not like nobody's ever run a sodium fast reactor before. We do have some operating history for sodium fast reactors. It's not like they've never been done before. They just have much less history than what's a BWRs. So I would love to see this be done just slightly ahead of the development of, let's say, natrium or sodium reactor project so that by the time we get ready to make our move, you know, move on the, the commercial plant and we get ready to deploy it, we've got a test bed available with VTR to be able to do experiments and testing because nobody likes to experiment with a billion dollar you know, power plant, right? And utility owners don't like that word, experiment with my billion dollar power plant. So they, they don't want to be doing testing. They want it to know that it's going to work, right? So um, yeah, I really think we need this. That's just my two cents, but yes. Um, following on the same question, yes. so from a regulatory point of view, is it necessary to have a project such as the UTR? Um, it depends on what you mean by necessary. We would say that it would certainly help in the licensing because the NRC and other regulators are not as familiar with sodium reactors as they are light water reactors. So when we get ready to go to the regulator with our design, there's going to be some questions because they're probably not going to have nearly as much familiarity with this technology. And so perhaps to help answer some of those questions that they might have, we can show them actual experimental data from a real reactor that we just took two days ago out in Idaho or Oak Ridge, wherever it gets built. Um, so it's not absolutely mandatory, but I think it would certainly help um, because we're dealing with a technology that is probably unfamiliar to a lot of regulators. Um, as far as I know, the NRC, as far as I know, you can correct me, I don't think the NRC has ever licensed the sodium reactor. The only sodium reactors we've had have been at, at DOE sites, at national labs or government sites. So there's definitely going to be a need for something that helps inform um, and is able to answer questions when we have questions about technology, right? Uh, irradiation of materials and instrumentation and flow testing. So I think it would help. I think it would certainly, certainly help. Um, and and I, I think that will also reduce the amount of time it takes to get through the regulatory process if you've got good data going in to help the regulator. So that's a good question. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I would say it certainly would, have, would, it would certainly help for sure. Okay, how are we doing on time? 4.30, okay, so here's probably the one that we are spending most of our time with right now, and that is Natrium. So G. Itachi and Terra Power partnered together. We won the ARDP, one of the Advanced Reactor Development uh, Program uh, contracts for the DOE, eight year project. I think we're coming up on starting year two. So we got a long way to go. Um, it's a terrific partnership in that it really blends um, GE's sort of historical legacy in the industry for many, many years. With Terra Power, which is a significantly newer company, but brings a lot of new ideas and a new innovative way of looking at nuclear. And we're basically looking at sort of merging these as sort of the uh, best athlete approach, as we like to say, right, is bringing, bringing the best from both organizations to be able to leverage for this project. Um, lots of things that are going to be important for Natrium. Um, again, you're going to see this design to cost show up everywhere, whether it's a BWR or a natrium reactor. Um, obviously, uh, emissions, dispatchable energy. One of the things that's really interesting about natrium is, um, and we think is, a, is a, a unique feature, is the ability for it to do um, uh, load following capabilities um, using the energy storage island. And I'll show that in a minute. Um, it has the ability to flex power up to about 500 megawatts electric, even though the core is only rated for about 345 megawatts electric. And so it basically works like this. Everything that's in the orange rectangle is what we would call the nuclear island, the sodium reactor. And then connected to it would be through a series of salt piping and heat exchanger, 
would be the what we're calling the energy storage island. That is everything in the blue. And if we play if we play our cards right, we should be able to operate this plant in such a way that the nuclear island operates at full power continuously, never derating, never decreasing power, just steady state operation. And then as energy is dumped to the energy storage island with these two energy storage tanks, those energy storage tanks can be the variable power to dispatch to the grid as the, as the demand fluctuates. So rather than cycling your nuclear reactor to load follow, you're cycling a non-nuclear energy island um, by trading off energy storage at these storage tanks and then generating a, with a steam turbine and then generating steam to put on the grid. Yes. Well, the format with the energy storage, would it just be a bunch of batteries or is there like hydrogen? No, molten salt. Molten salt. <laughs> molten salt. Yeah, molten salt. So, I mean, there are some molten salt reactor designs out there now, but the molten salt in this case is, is being used for the energy island. Yeah, that's what I have it. Um, it looks like it's inspired by Tencent British solar power plants because they kind of do the same thing that they have a Tencent British solar power, power and then they uh, direct that energy into energy storage system. Is it is it inspired by that? It's in, I would say it's inspired by the need, and this is going to be a very coarse analogy, so stick with me here, to, to help make a nuclear plant look more like a, a non-nuclear plant, a, a conventional plant, if that makes any sense. Yeah. You kind of get where I'm going there. Um, and we think that has some really significant advantages. And so what we see is something such as this. So here's a typical you know, load follow maneuver. Okay, so here you are. You know, it's it's uh, early in the morning and the power demand is down, right? There's you know, power demand goes is, is lower in the morning. And so we don't need uh, the 345 megawatt electric at the moment, but this will be storing energy. So it'll be storing energy on in the energy storage island. Then everybody wakes up, they get their coffee, they get their breakfast, maybe the power on the load begins to level off during the day. And now we can just dispatch the energy from the reactor just like we would uh, in any other situation. But then as you get through the day, and this is typically happens, you get this power peak during the day, right? Now, here's where things can get very interesting. You can be discharging energy from the molten storage from the energy island to a peak of about 500 megawatts, even though the reactor itself is only pumping out 345. And so you can essentially match the demand uh, based on what is happening on the grid. Now, for all of you financial people out there, what happens when demand on something goes up? What happens if the, if the supply is fixed, which is economics, what happens to the price? Right. So you want to be selling your energy to the grid right here. So you're basically, it's like putting money in the bank. You're storing energy when the, so we don't want to be selling energy here because the price is low, the demand is low. We want to be selling our energy right there. So you're basically storing energy when the price is low, conserving when the demand is flat. And then when the demand goes up and the price goes up, we start dispatching. And that's basically the idea. That's essentially the idea. So there's clearly an economic factor here, an economic driver for this, but also other factors as well in terms of being able to discharge, charge and discharge the molten salt, the molten salt storage tanks. And so this would be like a typical sort of wrap, sort of uh, uh, you know, evolution. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Oh, yes. Has any consideration been given to flexibility in terms of like seasonality, so like different times of year? Yes, and I think this could accommodate that. Um, again, this would be a daily cycle, right? This would be a daily cycle, but yes, this curve that that curve will change with seasons, and and this plant would give you the ability to to do that because it's got variable. And if you get into a season where you don't need a lot of energy, like summer usually needs a lot because of air conditioning, but maybe the fall. Is not so much because you know it's not that hot, not that cold. Well, then okay, then you're you're into the more of the store and conserve mode, right? So yeah, it can certainly accommodate that. Yeah, certainly. Okay, uh, I've got about twenty minutes. We'll try to get through these. So in some cases, GEH 
likes to be the lead or lead partner on some big projects like X300 or Natrium. In some cases, we're okay not being the lead. Um, we do not have a micro reactor design of our own, but we have a lot of experience that smaller companies don't have when it comes to building and testing a nuclear plant. And so we are involved in a number of micro reactor projects. Um, we were awarded last July uh, a contract to work with um, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corp uh, for the NASA sponsored through the DOE nuclear thermal propulsion. Uh, concept and so we were awarded this in um in july and we're working with them and you can see the other companies as well there's bwxt general atomics ultra safe nuclear is has the lead that it's their reactor side but we are providing uh system support um for this project and so i don't know how much you know about nuclear thermal rockets but they're really kind of cool um so one of the things that's been on a lot of people's minds these days is if we are going to ever make an attempt to get to Mars or any distant planet, we are going to have to have, I, I'm just thinking, I just don't see diesel engines doing it. And there's just not a lot of oxygen out there in deep space, chemical battery technology, chemical rockets. You might get there, but you're not getting back. You've got to have something that can make the journey and is reliable and really and truly in deep space, nuclear is probably about it. Even solar is tough because you're getting farther away from the sun and the solar and, the, and, the, and there's no wind, right? Because you're in deep space. So nuclear thermal propulsion is a really fascinating concept. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the NERVA program was in the 50s. Uh, it didn't get, didn't, they didn't pursue it any further, but it's really kind of making a comeback now with a lot of the things we're seeing. So um, You'd be looking at, you know, a, a very light element. It, it basically works like a jet engine, except instead of using air, it uses helium or hydrogen, right? A light element. Um, and you basically just, uh, once the reactor is up and running, you inject this, this cold gas um, and it heats up inside the core. Uh, there are control drums that turn to control reactivity because you can't have things going in and out because you don't have room for that. Um, and then basically it's heated up to a pretty significant temperature, compressed, heated, and then exhausted out the back uh, of a nozzle to generate thrust. Um, fortunately, you don't have to pulse very long because you're pretty much in zero gravity, right? So you, know, you're not, uh, you don't have to overcome gravity. And so you pulse for a couple of minutes and that gives you the push you need to go however many tens of millions of miles. And then you get another pulse uh, a couple of months later and eventually, if everything works out right, you're, you're making your way to Mars within six to nine months. Um, and then hopefully getting back. That would ultimately be the goal, right? So pretty interesting. Um, we are supplying, uh, we're, we're supporting them with a number of the parts and components for the nuclear island, for the nuclear plant. Again, not our design, but uh, we're definitely uh, a, a key partner with helping them with their components and their equipment. This is the, just so you know, that's the, that's, this is the ultra safe nuclear design. That's their, that's their logo. Um, okay, any questions on nuclear thermal rockets? You can impress all your friends when you tell them that you saw a talk on nuclear thermal rockets. So the other one that's interesting is fission surface power. So once we get to Mars or, or the moon, I think we're really looking at Mars here, you, you can't use a rocket to generate electricity because all it's doing is giving you propulsion. You need something else to give you electric power. And as I said before, not a lot of options here when you're on the surface of the moon or Mars, right? So nuclear really does play very, very strong in these specialized applications. I liken it to the nuclear Navy in the 1950s. I mean, nuclear in a submarine revolutionized the Navy because they didn't have to surface every 12 hours to recharge their batteries. This is really where we are today with space. I mean, nuclear is a key player in this. And so, these much, much smaller kilowatt level reactors are really what is being looked at for use um, either on the lunar or Martian surface to try to help power a small colony. Some interesting features, um, it's, it's got to be able to run at least 10 years without being refueled because we're not flying all the way to Mars just to refuel it. So it needs to be able to run pretty much remotely by itself, just pumping out anywhere from 10 to 50 kilowatts electric nonstop for 10 years without really needing much inter, inter, interaction or 
uh, or involvement from, from humans. Um, these things generally work on either a heat pipe or a small HGGR design, and they'll use a, like a Stirling engine or a closed loop Brayton cycle. Um, and you got to do this for less than 3,500 uh, 3, kilograms or less, because otherwise you can't actually get it into orbit in the first place. So some pretty significant technical challenges here in terms of mass and weight. It uses the uh, high assay, low enriched. So it is using fuel enriched to less than 20%. Um, you might wonder, well, hey, why don't you just use like highly enriched and then it can run for 50 years. Yes, it could, um, but there are concerns about launch safety with high enriched uranium being blasted into the atmosphere. Um, and so uh, at this point, NASA is not interested in looking at high enriched uranium reactors. They want the low enriched, the high assay low enriched. Um, but needless to say, it can still run, the designs can still go 10 years, which uh, would, would be, I think, a very good starting point. Okay. Any questions on that? So a completely different kind of technology. It, usual, it utilizes either uranium metal or uranium in a, um, in a triso form, like an HDGR. Um, so it's a little different than a typical reactor, um, but still nonetheless uh, very effective for this. Okay, last thing I'll talk about as we wrap up is, um, as is usually the case, our friends in the DOD find this, these technologies rather interesting as well. So the DOD has interest in mobile micronuclear reactors um, because they spend a significant amount of money and human loss of life transporting diesel fuel across the desert or to different parts of the world. Um, I was shocked by this statistic when we first started working on this project. I, I, I really was surprised that pretty much half of the casualties didn't come from live combat. It came from blowing up convoys of diesel fuel. That's a significant loss of human life, um, as well as the loss of, of financial resources. Um, so they're interested in a small, compact, high power, mobile nuclear reactor that can run for multiple years and not need to be refueled and can supply energy to an entire forward operating base or a remote operating base um, somewhere out you know, in, you know, in the Arctic, let's say. And so we're partnered with uh, one of the companies that is uh, bidding on this, that's, that's working on the design for this um, to try to provide this for the DOD. Um, we've been working on it a couple of years. The requirements are a little crazy. I mean, it's got to be able to generate one to 10 megawatt electric uh, for three years without refueling, but it also has to fit in a shipping container. Right? So that's kind of a challenge. Um, it has to be able to go from, uh, it has to be transportable, go from transport to arrival and start up within three days. Okay. Um, it has to be able to shut down and cool within seven days. It's got to fit in a standard ISO container. Lots of requirements, lots of con constraints on this one um, for, for reasons that the, the military is interested in. Um, and so we are now finishing up the first phase. We hope to go to phase two, which would be design and, and construction of the prototype unit in the next few years. Yes, I saw that hand first. Outside of those technical requirements, what kind of requirements are being done for safety of the nuclear reactor and what? Yeah, got to be passive, got to be passive safety, inherently safe. It has to use triso fuel. So it does lend itself to an HDGR kind of design. And as far as I know, the, the two remaining companies that are bidding this are dealing with an HDGR type design. That's there's nothing secret about that. I think most people realize that. Any shielding? Lots of shielding. Probably. Lots of shielding. So now the good news is you can have more than one box. That's the good news. But the power unit has to fit in a box, but you can have multiple boxes um, and it's got to be transportable by C-17. Um, so they'll be flying this thing around. Um, but yes, yeah, shielding has been, a, has been a, 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 an interesting challenge for sure. Um, as we've gone through, did you ever hear that somebody had there? Yes. And sort of like talking about what about proliferation risk? Uh, Halo fuel, less than 20% of rich. So now you could make the case that since this thing is a, on a military base surrounded by people with M16s and tanks and weapons, that maybe you could use high enrichment. But the decision was made that we will not use high enrichment. It'll, it'll continue to be LEU, high assay LEU, which is probably smart because if this thing gets hit by a, a you know a missile, 
it, it could be, there, there could be some serious complications there. Um, I, I won't go into the detail, details, but there's lots of security around this in terms of design and how it's going to be used. Yes. Uh, two questions, yeah. Like, hey, thank you for doing this, because I, I never look at these chat things here. Uh, would a strong team 90 be more efficient? Oh, uh, and justification. The question was about the 35. Oh, okay. This is the okay. This is the fission surface power. Um, yeah, I I think the strontium 90 might be more efficient, but you might have trouble getting 10 kilowatt electric out of it. I don't know that for sure. Plus, it has to run 10 years. So um, they this is specific to fission surface power. So they want a fission reactor for the fission surface power. Um, the question was about the 3500 kg and 10 kilowatt power source. Yeah. So yeah, it's. You could use radioisotope sources, but they need to generate a lot of a lot of energy because you got to realize 50 kilowatts electric is what? How many? What kind of power level are we talking about? Thermal? Yeah, you're going to need some pretty hefty power, right? And you know you're going to be talking hundreds of kilowatts, you know, maybe more. That's maybe difficult to get that kind of power with uh, at a radioisotope source because you're only talking about a third, maybe one third of efficiency, cycle efficiency. Okay, is there another one? I think that was it. Okay, all right, so that's all I had. And I finished with 10 minutes to swing. Okay, you've done well asking questions as we go. What other questions do you have? Yes. Um, so when it comes to the great move cycle for these high temperature gas reactors, yep. I usually see helium being utilized as the coolant. Um, something that I came across online was Regarding the limited supply of helium in Earth's atmosphere, is this something that is brought to your attention as a concern down the line for supply chain? And is it something you could address, you know, if you have a reactor in space, could it harness like helium mining in a different Yeah, atmosphere? so helium is uh, um, a little bit of a problem. It's very leaky. I don't know how much you know about helium. It tends to leak pretty much in everything. So it diffuses through metal. It's 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 not a fun element to deal with. It's inert, right? So but yes, your question is, yeah, the answer to your question is yes, that is a concern. There, that is something that is being looked at. Because if you want to deploy hundreds of those kind of units, that's a lot of helium. And plus, there's going to need to be a helium resupply because you're going to have some leakage, maybe one or a couple of percent uh, a month or two, right? So yeah, there's going to have to be a helium resupply for each one of these. So yes, your question, the answer is yes, it is a concern. It absolutely is a good I guess to follow up on that, what other working fluids have been considered for that? Well, we looked at supercritical CO2, and uh, the core would have to be twice as big. And that didn't go over well with uh, the folks, uh, with our customer. Mm -hmm. So it, there's just not a lot to choose from, unfortunately. It's just not a lot to choose from. You need something that's, that's light, that can conduct the heat, that has very, if not, if almost zero neutronic properties. Yeah, it's, the, the list is kind of short. The list is kind of short. So um, that is the direction that, that that we've been going in. But we have looked at we did look at other ones, but helium is probably the, the, the medium of choice. Yeah. Yes. So for the small molecular reaction design, I'm not sure if I did right, but you say that extensively system cooling and everything. Yes. So in case of the main field work like break. Yep. So the natural circulation will be the only thing to remove the KG. Yes. And that is that will be enough? Yes. Okay. Yep. yep. Okay. okay. I feel like I went through that really fast, but I didn't want to go over. I want to be respectful of your time. So okay. okay. Follow up comments. Oh, more comments. There we go. Give me okay. 40 kg reactor time with the latest numbers, but I see your point that presentation being on surface power. Yeah, yeah, it is It is directed towards surface power. The NASA was very clear. I mean, they've done very well with uh, radioisotope generator sources, but their, their, their desire here was very clear. They want a fission surface power reactor um, uh, for this application. Um, so that's what we're targeting. Yeah, I, I have a question. Yeah, please, so, please. What energy storage in natrium, what, uh, which salt are you using? I don't know. Okay. I do not know. Okay. Uh, and the, the, it also has a power conversion unit. It does. Right. Okay. Yep, it does. Okay. okay. Any questions? Any more questions from the? What's that? Yeah. No, no, he's talking about salt. 
Salt, yeah. He's a little salt. Yeah. yeah. So maybe last question for the Germany okay. the reactor uh, for space. So like lately or in the 60s, they did experiment or they did a lot of snap damage or uh, electric uh, these propulsion systems. Yes. And so they have more data experiment and experience in that for the regulatory to decide whether they're going to. We have some. We, we do have some. I wouldn't say a lot, yeah. but we do have some. Yes. It's very experimental. But now, like, we're inventing the way for Germany to follow the German propulsion, which we didn't do before. Right. So how, right. How that would be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're, they're, uh, there were ground tests done at Los Alamos with the Nerva rocket. Um, it never, as far as I know, it never flew. It never went into space. But there were ground tests that were done at, to, as a demonstration. Uh, but yeah, that, this would take that to the next step. This would take it to the next step for sure. And I would imagine there's going to be pretty significant ground testing before this thing is put up, you know, in orbit or out or out of the orbit uh, before they do that. And the project that I just mentioned with the DOD, that, that's all for a prototype. This is just for the prototype. We're just doing a testing prototype to show it can be done. It's a demonstration. It's like a demonstration project. Um, so before they start making production units, that's still a few years away. So, yes. So for Natrium, you have a heat exchanger then with the sodium coolant and, and a molten salt and a molten salt. That's going to go from your nuclear island out to the energy production island. Yep, energy storage. And then yep. you're going to store it. And I guess is the return then coming back, trying to be coming at the same temp? Like, what's the temperature of your um, I don't know offhand, but okay. it will be lower. Okay. And I don't know if you noticed on the slide, but there were two energy storage tanks. Yep. So while one is charging, the other could be discharging okay. so that they can do this while while they're operating so that you can charge and just by charging one you can discharge the other if you need to. okay if you need to okay yeah and you know i mean obviously everybody knows you know sodium and water do not play well together so you want to be very careful about having a direct water heat exchanger with sodium as the primary because you have a steam generator or tube leak and it does not end well so the, the molten salt is that intermediate to, to keep it safe yeah, yeah. So let's take our last question. So we have a question in the Zoom. Oh, Patrick. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Are there any projects that have looked at americium or other high cross section fissile? Um, not at this time. I think the thought with the the fissile isotopes or the fissionable isotopes for U two thirty five are probably the ones that are going to be most considered. Um, the halo. There is a good supply of halo fuel. Um, so I, as far as I know, we're not looking at any other types of materials other than U-235 at this point. Okay. So thanks, everybody. Um, so if you want to have a more discussion with Dr. Zeno, uh, you're welcome to join the discussion on the Duke Energy Council room uh, between 5 and 6. And we're going to have some student section interaction with Dr. Zeno. So let's thank our speaker. Okay, it was a great presentation. <laughs>